At a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, the human body starts to break down. Organs turn off, the kidneys begin to fail, and no amount of sweat can cool you down. It's 42 degrees across Uttar Pradesh in India. A prolonged heat wave bakes the cities and their surrounding landscape throughout the region. The scorching air is inescapable as blackouts roll through cities, rendering air conditioning useless. The elders are the first to go. And as the days stretch on under the oppressive humidity and heat, the young start to fall with them. Hyperthermia and lack of sleep brings a slow death as people flock to bodies of water to cool off. But even the promise of water on skin is dashed by the heat. The lake is now just a large hot tub, no longer providing that cool escape. Tens of millions die in the heat wave. As the present breaks off into a million strands of potential futures, this is one such future we could face. One envisioned in the first chapter of Kim Stanley Robinson's speculative climate fiction book, The Ministry for the Future. Grappling with the potential pathways of climate change can be a daunting task, especially when scenarios like Stanley Robinson's loom on the horizon. But the path into the future isn't linear. That future doesn't have to come to pass. Millions of potentialities spread out as the years tick onward towards 2100. Some of these threads contain within them multitudes of bright futures full of joy, healing, and deep connection with others in the natural world. These are the futures of solar punk, of eco-socialism, of imagery like this. But there are also darker threads on the fringes, on the other side of the spectrum of our response to climate change. Scenarios that are easy to ignore because they invoke too much dread, grief, and anxiety. Unfortunately, we cannot ignore them. Understanding the risks of worst case climate change scenarios help us formulate responses appropriate to the scale of the problem. If there's a small fire in your kitchen that could potentially burn your house down, you're not going to wait and see what happens because you've got to finish cooking dinner. You're going to grab the fire extinguisher and put it out. The chance of climate catastrophe is that little fire that could grow into an inferno in your kitchen if we don't pay attention. So today we must dive into the climate change projections that should shake us awake with the scale of their potential disasters. These are the extremely high global warming scenarios with a small chance of happening, but if they do, they could bring death, suffering, extinction, and collapse. Today we must face down the reality of the potential extremes of the climate crisis. This video is made possible by my amazing viewers who support me on Patreon. Over the last two years, my revenue from ads and Patreon has dropped dramatically. So much so that if this trend continues, making videos like these will become less and less financially viable. So I have a quick ask. Our changing climate will always be free for everyone regardless of how much I make. But OCC is a one person operation and it would be nice to earn enough to pay for rent and my health insurance, both of which seem to increase yearly. So if you've been a longtime viewer or just stumbled across this channel, thank you for watching and please consider supporting our changing climate on Patreon with the link in the description. Just $1 a month from a small portion of my audience would be huge for the channel and to be honest, me. To understand what the future holds, we must first understand the present. Today, global temperatures hover around 1.2 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. Already, that one degree has fueled storms, droughts, and disasters the likes of which we rarely see. As author of The Uninhabitable Earth, David Wallace Wells notes in a recent talk, The weather impacts on the American city of, of Houston, which has been hit by five of what were once called 500-year storms in five years. 500 years ago, there were no Europeans in North America at all. So we're talking about a storm that we'd expect to hit once during that entire history. And Houston's been hit by five of them in five years. So it's literally millennia of extreme weather compressed into half a decade. We are now living in a world that is completely different from anything our ancestors have experienced, and it will only continue to transform. The gold standard of climate science, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report, notes that even with all of the climate commitments from countries over the last eight years since the Paris Climate Agreement, the world is on track for 3.2 degrees with a high end of 3.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. 3.2 to 3.5 degrees of warming is already bad. It will bring unprecedented flooding, hurricanes, drought, wildfire, and extinction. 
but the problem is that the majority of the work has yet to happen to fulfill many of those climate commitments that would keep us below 3 degrees Celsius of warming. With many plans relying on net zero strategies of continuing to burn fossil fuels while waiting on the hope of a massive upscaling of untested carbon capture technologies. Already, many countries have failed to meet the pace of their commitments, and there is a shocking lack of confidence from IPCC scientists on positive climate outcomes. Considering this, it is just prudent and basic risk assessment to consider the low probability extreme catastrophe scenarios. The scenarios where a combination of unmitigated fossil capitalism crashes headfirst into cascading tipping points locking in decades of extreme warming. The potential of these scenarios are very low, within a 5-10% to possibility, and would have to mean no country takes action on climate change during the next 75 years. But as Gernot Wagner and Martin Weitzman note in their book Climate Shock, if you had a 10% chance of having a fatal car accident, you take necessary precautions. If your finances had a 10% chance of suffering a severe loss, you'd reevaluate your assets. So if we know the world is warming and there's a 10% chance that this might eventually lead to a catastrophe beyond anything we could imagine, why aren't we doing more about climate change right now? We must take extreme climate scenarios more seriously. Not because these pathways will be the most likely future, but because we have to be prepared in the off chance that extreme warming does happen. While modeling for below 3 degrees Celsius scenarios seems to take up much of the research, there is still some literature on the potential for above 3 degrees scenarios. Like this paper from the renowned climate scientist James Hansen, or this one on the potential for a hothouse earth scenario. The futures these papers like out are bleak, but the possible worlds they envision should be more than enough to galvanize us into action, to try as hard as possible to make sure those worlds never exist. As David Wallace Wells writes in his widely read piece for New York Magazine, it is worse than you think. He wrote that in 2018. And after six years, Wallace Wells notes that climate outcomes are more promising, but the worst case warming scenarios still look as bad as ever. Even as more countries map out paths to net zero economies, the possibility that commitments fail, that fossil fuels continue to burn at ever growing rates, and that capitalist production continues to run rampant still looms. The latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change models a pathway that if we continue on with fossil capitalist business as usual, temperatures could reach as high as 5.7 degrees Celsius of warming with 4.4 degrees as the middle range. With each degree of warming, disaster threats compile and cascade, potentially adding to even more warming as we'll soon see. Indeed, there is still a lot of uncertainty around the extent of global temperature rise over the next century. The amount of warming depends both on how much and how how quickly the world takes climate action in the coming decades, as well as how soon or if natural tipping points thrust us deeper into the climate crisis. Even substantial economic growth could make high emissions scenarios more plausible. As one paper notes, higher economic growth rates should make the high emissions scenario 35% more likely. This uncertainty, combined with the knowledge that fossil capitalism will fight tooth and nail to protect its profits and extractivist interests, means scenarios above 4 degrees of warming are still a possibility. And a world above 4 degrees of warming would look dramatically different than it does today. To begin, we'll travel to the island nation of Vanuatu, an archipelago in the Pacific Ocean already battling rising seas caused by 1.2 degrees of warming. Since 1993, sea level has risen 6 millimeters per year along the coast of Vanuatu, a seemingly minuscule measurement that has already had devastating consequences. According to the New York Times, Vanuatu has already had to relocate six whole villages across four of its islands, and under a high emission scenario, this damage will rapidly increase. Unfettered emissions and warming means more frequent Category 5 hurricanes like Cyclone Pam that hit the archipelago in 2015, destroying 17,000 buildings and displacing 65,000 people. The IPCC notes that the possibility of sea level rise of 2 meters by 2100 and in excess of 15 meters by 2300 under the very high greenhouse gas emission scenario cannot be excluded, an amount that would be the final nail in the coffin for large chunks of coastal towns across Vanuatu. 
throughout the world, warming above 4 degrees means an accelerated pace of Arctic ice melting as well as the swelling of ocean water. If the worst case of 15 meters of sea level rise occurs, it would plunge vast swaths of countries like Bangladesh, which already experiences dangerous floods, wholly underwater. Even in imperial core cities like Amsterdam or New York City, low-lying land will become unlivable, forcing people to migrate to higher ground. And if the water doesn't reach you, the heat will. According to the think tank Chatham House, heat-related mortality has increased by nearly 54% for people over the age of 65 in the past two decades, reaching 296,000 deaths in 2018. In 2019 alone, a potential 300 billion working hours were lost due to temperature increases globally. 52% more than in 2000. Under pathways that bring us above 4 degrees Celsius of warming, this number will balloon as heat grows more severe. At 4 degrees, some equatorial and desert cities will become unlivable, like the port city of Al Hudeda in Yemen, where in a much hotter world, the residents would experience an estimated 301 days of temperatures intolerable to humans. Meanwhile, one paper explains that around 2.7 billion persons will experience at least one week of daytime ambient conditions associated with uncompensable heat stress, 1.5 billion will experience a month under such conditions, and 363.7 million will be faced with an entire season of life-altering extreme heat. In short, ambient heat and humidity will make countless cities ghost towns for months of the year. And yes, the Imperial Corps will certainly feel the effects of this heat. As David Wallace Wells notes, at 4 degrees, the deadly European heat wave of 2003, which killed as many as 2 thousand people a day will be a normal summer in Europe. He adds that at 6 degrees of warming in the United States, summer labor of any kind would become impossible in the lower Mississippi Valley, and everybody in the country east of the Rockies would be under more heat stress than anyone anywhere in the world today. This is the future we could face if business as usual continues on, one where farm workers must literally work in a global sauna to put food on the plates of those sitting in the comfort of their air-conditioned dining room. But that meal will also be at risk as the world reaches 4 degrees of warming. Permanent extreme droughts will be the norm by the end of the century in Europe, causing worse than Dust Bowl-like conditions. Increased rainfall will mean frequent floods in Central Africa and South Asia, and the damage of hurricanes like Maria or Cyclone Daniel will be commonplace. Not to mention, the IPCC notes that a world warmed past 4 degrees will cause substantial species loss, further accelerating the sixth mass extinction. Keep in mind, this is just until the end of the century. If fossil-fueled capitalism manages to make it through these disasters gripping to the seat of power and production, then global temperatures could continue to rise past that gruesome benchmark of 4 degrees Celsius. So with all of this possibly on the horizon, it is just prudent risk assessment to act decisively to cut fossil fuel emissions and build strong and resilient economies. Because as much as extreme temperature pathways will fuel instabilities throughout the natural world, it will also catalyze conflict, political tension, and social unrest. Our current global capitalist economy is not built to survive a world that's 4 degrees warmer. For over 10,000 years, global temperatures have remained relatively steady, allowing humans to flourish through agricultural ingenuity and explode in population under the capitalist mode of production. But as capital has ushered in an era of extreme production and fossil fuel extraction, it is also digging its own grave. A world built on the accumulation of wealth is ill-equipped for the coming storm of extreme temperature. As we glimpsed in a future of extremes, weather, heat, and sea level rise won't cascade into just natural disasters. Climate change will be the catalyst of conflict, migration, and instability across the world. As we've already seen, with drought and extreme weather comes food instability. Our current food system is already fragile. It fails hundreds of millions of people as they struggle to buy food which has been heavily commodified within a global market. Prolonged droughts or frequent floods that would be common in a world warmed to over 4 degrees Celsius would push that food system over the edge. Our capitalist food system is not about getting the most food into the most hands, but about selling the most food to get the best profit margins and accumulate capital. And when unimaginable crop loss is introduced into that equation, famine is inevitable. Indeed, for the top four maize-producing regions, accounting for 87% of maize production, the likelihood of production losses greater than 10% under a 2 degrees temperature rise to 86% under 4 degrees. 
In short, a much warmer world will mean it would be much harder to grow and harvest food. And every degree matters. Under 4 degrees of warming, many will lose their ability to grow the very stuff of life. And while famine presses down on us from one side, intense heat and humidity will quite literally cook our brain capacity and increase our propensity for violence. Today, the pressures of a warmer planet have already exacerbated tensions, like in the case of the Syrian civil war or more broadly the Arab Spring. Conflicts whose tensions were heightened, as some researchers have claimed, by climate change-fueled drought and instability. As Wallace Wells writes, pulling on evidence from researchers Marshall Burke and Solomon Tsang, for every half degree of warming, societies will see between a 10 to 20 percent increase in the likelihood of armed conflict. A planet five degrees warmer would have at least half a again as many wars as we do today. And these wars, alongside the increased intensity and frequency of hurricanes, wildfires, and droughts, will force millions out of their homes, driving a vicious feedback loop of migration and conflict. A study from the World Bank estimates that if we don't take major action on climate change, by 2050, 216 million people will be on the move in their own countries. And as the researchers are quick to note, these are conservative numbers, because the percentage of people exposed to life-threatening heat stress is projected to rise from today's 30% to 48 to 76%. That's just from heat and humidity alone. Natural disasters, increases in pandemics, and species extinction will only grow as the planet heats, forcing even more migration locally and internationally. And partly, this migration is driven by capitalism's penchant for protecting profits and production, not people. Indeed, for multinationals and free market hawks, disasters are a boon for their bottom line. They can be an opportunity to build luxury hotels on recently destroyed beaches or push through privatization of public goods in what is known as disaster capitalism. And within this context of instability, fossil capitalism will fight tooth and nail to maintain power. As I discussed in my video on fossil fascism, this could look like the rise to power of a series of fossil fascist strongmen like Trump or the ex-president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who wield racist ultranationalist rhetoric as a shield against attacks on fossil fuels. Or it could look like the rise of eco-fascism, which seeks to protect national environments and racial purity by cutting carbon and preserving land, but in the process, shoring up the the nation's borders and assuring the continued flow of wealth and capital to that nation. The instability and chaos that are inevitable at 4 degrees Celsius of warming could be the fuel used to boost this right-wing extremism onto the global stage once again. It is, after all, in times of great shock, as Naomi Klein explains in The Shock Doctrine, when people are most vulnerable and susceptible to violent regimes of austerity and authoritarianism. All of these natural and societal vectors push on each other in a dynamic cascade of collapse. We can see here in a flowchart from a paper on worst case climate scenarios just how interconnected these forces are. It's not just natural tipping points like the melting of permafrost which releases even more greenhouse gases into the air or the mass die off of the Amazon rainforest, but also economic and social tipping points that will plunge us deeper into collapse if we continue down the road of extreme global temperatures. If one domino falls, it could tip off a chain of destruction that ripples across the globe. And the higher global temperatures tick, the more likely it is for those dominoes to fall. So we must prevent that cascade of potential disaster. And thankfully, we're already making strides to do just that. Take a deep breath in and breathe it out. Wherever you are, feel the ground beneath you. These catastrophic scenarios are a lot to take in, but take heart that these are just potential futures. They have not yet come to pass. Remember that these pathways are some of the worst case scenarios. There's a 5-10% to chance that these futures happen. We have a very real chance of stopping them. So instead of sinking deep into despair about these catastrophic futures, use them to galvanize you into action. Because of recent climate commitments, China and the US's mobilization of renewable capacity, and the fact that now in 90% of the world it is cheaper to install renewables than fossil fuel plants, the current models chart out 2.7 degrees to 3.4 degrees of warming by the end of the century. This is still bad. 
but certainly a not as bad scenario. But of course, a lot can happen between now and the end of this century. We can do a lot better than 2.7 degrees of warming, but it will require immense pressure from below in the form of mass movements like we saw in 2019, combined with all sorts of tactics like non-reformist reforms, blockades, and when appropriate, attacking fossil capital directly through sabotage. We need to force a rapid downscaling of production and fossil fuel extraction. We need to address fossil capital head on, because the faster we abolish fossil fuels, the brighter our future will be. Turning a blind eye, ignoring these worst case scenarios doesn't make them magically disappear. They are looming on the horizon and we need to face them down in order to rationally plan for the coming catastrophe. If we use these futures as kindling to ignite passion and love for all that we have on this world, our future could be a beautiful one. But if we sink into complacency or despair, letting others handle this global crisis, the future of warming could be a whole lot darker. Because preventing a catastrophic future requires the passion, the organizing, and the commitment of all people everywhere to build a just, more sustainable, and ethical planet. If you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious by the possibilities of extreme climate change and collapse, one thing that has helped me immensely over the years to feel and sit with my emotions is meditation. So I made a guided meditation for collapse for all of my supporters over on Patreon. Those wonderful Patreon supporters have been keeping this channel and myself afloat for the last seven years. Recently, my revenue, however, has been slipping because of a combination of demonetization and lower sponsorship rates. And my Patreon supporters have given me financial consistency so I can pay my rent and ever-increasing healthcare premiums. So I'm turning to you, the wonderful people who watch my videos month in and month out. If you have the means, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon using the link in the description. Just pledging a dollar a month is huge for the channel, and when you become a Patreon supporter, you'll get early access to my videos, bonus content like that guided meditation, or even the occasional full-length interview with authors or scholars. But of course, if you aren't able to support this channel financially, please don't worry. Just by watching this video to the end, you've done your part. So thank you, and thank you so much to those who already support me on Patreon. You're the reason I'm able to make videos like this. So again, thank you, and I'll see you next month.